thank you all for coming tonight um, to one of our last meetings of Conjunctio for our s fall semester. Um, I am, again, just as I've sort of expressed in each of the emails, like really happy to be introducing um, Erica, uh, <laughs> who sort of passed the torch of Conjunctio to me through so many other hands, and yet it just feels really good to kind of have her here. Um, it's sort of like a culmination of a vision, it feels like, to have mm. you on this side, kind of, um, of the group. So I'm really grateful to her for having had the foresight to create this. I um, was at a Student Alliance meeting today where they were proposing new groups, and I thought so fondly of how Erica must have at one point done this. Like She went there and she said, I have this crazy idea, and five years later it's still going strong, and we owe so much of that to, to her. So um, thank you all for coming, and this is uh, Erica Jones with um, Forging the Real Imaginal. We're going to talk about Neptune and then I guess, as always, a little bit of Saturn, right? Saturn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Okay. Wow, well, it's, it is interesting to be on this side. Um, after having founded Conjunctio right as soon as I joined CIS, pretty much the second semester I was here, and owe a lot to Chad for his support and also Jessica garfield Kabar for her support um, in getting this off the ground and running and bringing the real astrological knowledge as I was still learning quite a bit at that time. Um, so I've been studying astrology since probably about 2006, 2007, I date it. Um, I came to CIS in 2009, studied with Richard Tarnas who teaches here. And I'm, but I'm also influenced by other approaches and astrologers. I, I like Donna Cunningham, um, Sue Tompkins, Liz Green is interesting. Um, they all have their different views and have contributed something to, to my understanding. But really what I practice and what I like to teach is it's a matter of cultivating your own relationship with the cosmos, your own um, living conversation with these gods and goddesses, these divinities that seem to have their own ideas about what's going on here. So I um, suppose that's a little bit about me. Also, my relationship with Neptune. Um, I was born with Sun, Mercury, and Neptune, and Sagittarius in a tight conjunction all in the same part of the sky. And, I'm, and I, I love Neptune, and it is also a struggle. And I have, um, I'd like that whenever I started to really write this, transiting Venus in the sky was conjunct my Neptune. So my love of Neptune sort of saturates uh, this particular talk. And um, I think currently the sun in the sky is conjoining my natal Neptune. So we'll see how this goes. Um, <laughs> forging the real imaginal, the re-enchantment of Neptune. Um, so I, I would like to offer a quick poem to invoke the archetype. Um, Neptune, both fair and foul. Neptune, shapeshifter without predecessor. Eternal litany of formless form, image, potential. Populating a drunken landscape without horizon. Where paradox dissolves into itself and navigation proves treacherous. Yet a mysterious orientation point emerges in those who learn to listen and follow, ebb and flow, with the dreaming tides of the earth divine. By yielding to some beckoning from beyond, begging for discernment, offering no hard boundary between self and other, creativity appears infinite from within the perspective of the Great Mother, shimmering like Indra's net. Each being holographic, a reflection of the whole. And hard to see the unseen, what all is hidden by virtue of our being, both the container and the contained. So, for those of you who are familiar with Neptune, and I would like to know who, who here knows very little about astrology. Okay, so we got a few. <laughs> okay. Um, moi. Moi. Thank you. Um, so, 
Well, I would just want to kind of engage everyone to try to bring the archetype in the room and what we, what we know of it, maybe little, maybe a lot. Um, keywords, or what comes to mind for Neptune? It, and it could be feelings, it could be features of the natural world, um, human artifacts, things that humans have made, or moral values. Dreams, dreams. Liminal. Liminal. Aspirations. Aspirations. I'll take that. Boundless. Boundless. Art. Mm. Art. Art. Mm -hmm. Self deception. Self deception. Mm -hmm. Addiction. Addiction. Everything is connected. Everything. Everything is connected. Mystical. Mystical. Insanity. 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 Projection. Projection. Lazy. Lazy? Mm -hmm. Sleepy. Sleepy, huh? Oh. <laughs> mm. Unconscious. Unconscious? Attachment. Mm, yeah, attachment. Unhealthy boundaries. Huh. Movies. Movies. Yeah, I was hoping someone would say that. Movies, cinema, mm. film. Mm. The surreal. The surreal. Yeah. I remember that Rachel Carson has a lot of Neptune. Mm. So what are imagination, sense of, a na of nature as a whole, through the person of Rachel Carson? Yeah. Sensitivity, too, perhaps, yeah. to the poisoning that she saw, she witnessed. There's a little Saturn. Compassion. Mm. Welcome. Enchantment, yay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, riddle me that. <laughs> How does that happen? Mm. Okay. I feel like, I'm sorry? Spirit, spirit. Magic. Ooh, I'm feeling Neptune creeping in. It's really nice. Subtle. Subtle. And subtlety, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Any more burning, burning bits of Neptune or dripping bits of Neptune that want to come in? <laughs> I can't help but think of sacrifice and, and martyrdom, too. Sacrifice and martyrdom. Okay. Hmm. Neptune. Yeah. Sorry? Seeking redemption. Yeah. Wholeness. Wholeness. Creativity. Hmm? Creativity. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm. Longing. <laughs> longing. Sure. Unf unfulfillable longing. Unquenchable longing in some cases, yes. <laughs> mm. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I guess we'll leap in now into these waters. And um, I began the description of this talk with, OMG, oh my God, Neptune is real. I'm implying that there can be a subtle orientation to Neptune as patently unreal, that it's only delusion, deception, illusion, a worthless fiction, illness, and paralysis. Um, this inscrutable and amorphous quality of reality that is Neptune is just a sham. It's a distraction from what's important. It's an annoying bog to just be kind of filled in with other useful things. See this orientation. And I, I think an easy example of a generally negative casting of Neptune can be found in um, Reinhold Ebertin's sociological correspondences for Neptune. And he says, quote, people with a negative outlook on life who are easily influenced by others. 
mediums, persons of doubtful character, crooks or tricksters. Okay, this is true of Neptune. It's totally true. I wouldn't say it isn't, but it's just like a problematic part of it. It's definitely not the panoply of expression of this archetype. And, you know, he doesn't speak so harshly of Uranus. You know, flip through his book. I've got his book over there if you want proof. He doesn't speak so harshly of Uranus um, or Saturn. Saturn, he says, sociological correspondence is hardworking, inhibited, or sad people, agriculture, mining, real estate. So I just, I don't hear the judgment, even for Saturn, which tends to get a lot of judgment. It's just like, eh, this is Saturn. But I think to qualify Abertine in his personal experience, he witnessed the concentration camps of World War II. He experienced the high delusion of Nazi Germany, the entrancement with its heroic mythos, and that's very much the realm of Neptune. And that's really, I think, what colors Abertine's experience and presentation of the archetype. And while I don't know if Abertine was aware of his bias, I think it's good to develop awareness of, of our assumptions and our biases, the inherited concepts that we have, including how a disenchanted worldview can impact our perception of, but especially our interaction with planetary archetypes above all, Neptune. And so the term disenchantment, what is this? It originates with the sociologist um, Max Weber, and he wrote of the modern mind's uh, dislocation, dislocation from the cosmos through a process of, of relocating all meaning and purpose to the human subject, avoiding of the world and all which is not human of intrinsic value and meaning, such that eventually through time, um, all, all around us is considered a collection of objects, resources to be exploited, um, everything assigned a usefulness to humanity. This is its value, or maybe to a specific segment of humanity if we're gonna get really truthful. And whatever else is deemed not useful may be abandoned, ignored, just removed as so much rubbish. It's just not, there's not this value placed in it. So in short, disenchantment means an objectification of the world, a removal of its own subjecthood, and an impoverishment of the sense of the sacred. Now, when you think of Neptune, Neptune itself pertains to a sense of the sacred. It is of the divine or the greater than human dimensions of existence, the capacity to feel empathy for another and the possibility of compassion. And so we find in a bit, quite a bit of the astrological literature, Neptune is something to be tolerated, to be wary of, be on high critical alert because it just does, it doesn't fit into a value system which places control, specifically human agency in such high esteem. Our own consciousness, which Neptune consciousness, in the largest sense, isn't so much something to participate with or to be curious about or receptive to, but can be approached as, and quite frequently in a lot of psychology, it's something to be conquered, pinned down, controlled. We're going to put it in this map and we understand it. So there's this presumption that the ego or the consciousness of self, which is represented by the sun, S-U-N, in astrology, should be in control and orchestrating, choosing the movements of psyche as opposed to, on the other hand, could be tracking those movements, listening, participating with what's happening, surrendering as well as struggling internally. So we can notice a privileging of a particular kind of clarity and knowing. For example, an interest uh, in attempting to observe life through dissecting dead bodies rather than observing li living beings and processes in their own autonomous functioning. And, and a, sort of an orientation of some kind of clarity that, such that Saturn's powers, Saturn's very important powers of definition, limits, and the appearance of concrete reality function to negate Neptune's reality rather than play along with it. So we humans must live by belief. This is a fundamental aspect of being human, I say. And the presence of belief seems pretty intrinsic, just to having self-reflective consciousness, to know that we know, to be aware of oneself. Neptune is inescapable, it seems. Even no belief is still a belief. No belief, it's still a belief. And so I think that this really brings the motif of play into sharp focus, and it means taking Neptune seriously. If one studies anthropology or cultural history or just really any um, sort of historical development of human consciousness, look at that. It, it becomes apparent that what's considered to be true today will be seen in a very different light by generations to come. 
the so-called, even the scientific clarity we think we now have is, is an illusion. It's still in Neptune's realm. It's, it's, there's so much more that we don't know. We're swimming, or maybe we're sinking in mystery. And quite often it's the invisible, which constitutes our knowledge, lacunae, which come to define everything surrounding them. So the emission of intuitive, imaginal, somatic, other ways of knowing from modern science is a good example of such a lacuna. It's invisible, this facet of our way of knowing is invisible to too many of the practitioners who create that discipline. Or the fact that we do not know where we come from when we're born, we, we, we don't know where we go when we die. This is a, a tremendous driver of civilization, of human culture. And no matter how much any one of us may believe we're operating with an empirical reality, thinking that all of our knowledge is derived from and driven by sense perception, it, it just seems like we can't escape Neptune. Belief, imagination, ideals, those so-called intangibles create worlds. They build realities and exert a tremendous influence in this world of the visible. And so I see the rehabilitation of Neptune as an invitation um, to a renewed relationship with humility. It seems to be, that seems to be a key element of re-enchantment itself. Re-enchantment being an attempt to regain a sense of belonging in a living, aware cosmos. Beyond that, the act of knowing is endless. And I admit I'm choosing to describe the world as a verb. It's something in movement and process. It's happening, as Buckminster Fuller wrote. I seem to be a verb, an evolutionary process, an integral function of the universe. I seem to be a verb. I'm verbing. I'm Erica Jonesing. <laughs> <laughs> a little nephew joke. But, you know, this is why I would argue that knowing is happening and happening endlessly. It's not just a one time thing. You know, like, I've learned something, I know something. Um, Contexts shift and change, new information comes in. Interpretive frameworks lose their power over our consciousness or are just simply seen through. Again and again, you can see this in, in history. Um, even old information can form the basis for new knowledge through changes in our interaction with it. Um, an example would be the modern astrological revival. Um, so, and also there's this weird thing that there's all these different worldviews coexisting on this single planet. They all have their particular claims to coherence and integ integrity, but we're we're in this Saturnian you know, reality, material reality together. And I think perhaps this is because the universe is best understood through analogy. As the cultural historian and geologian Thomas Berry emphasizes, um, so the, I'm gonna try my best to describe this. The, the primary aim of all modern scientific language is univocality or pinning down only one unambiguous meaning for each word. So this word means this and nothing else. Univocal, one voice. We only want to have one meaning for each word. But if the universe itself is not a univocal phenomenon, um, but an analogous one, or you could say a poetic phenomenon, things have many meanings to them. This means that the universe itself does not have a single meaning. It, it doesn't render itself intelligible to this univocal approach. Being analogous, the universe is not a static, unchanging phenomenon. It's, it's fluid, it's changeable, it's interactive and responsive. It invites us to understand by way of metaphorical language and comparisons. So not a literalizing it, it description, and I'll try to give an example, concerning the formation of stars. Uh, from a book called The Universe Story, written by um, Brian Swim, who teaches here, and um, Thomas Berry. So, quote, to say that the quantum tendencies of the hydrogen are influenced by density waves passing through the cloud of hydrogen, and that this shock wave initiates the cloud's implosion, star, is to describe an event using the univocal language of physics. But, an equivalently valid, if metaphorical, expression might be to say that the hydrogen listens to the voices of the galaxy and responds by creating stars. As Swim and Berry point out, their analogical description of the formation of stars reflects the interactive nature of the process that both the gravity wave and the cloud of hydrogen participate in star formation. 
the univocal, the single single meaning approach. The univocal definitions tend to animate passive and mechanomorphic ideas, a machine-based kind of idea. Where, whereas Barry asserts that analogy is key to all human communion with the non-human, whether it's the divine or the natural world. The divine has ways of speaking that are not human ways. So too do natural phenomena have ways of speaking that are not human language. And Barry asserts the effort to reduce all wisdom to univocal language is a primary error or failure of our times. And so what Barry is saying is that we can understand the divine, but we're going to have to listen in creative ways. We can communicate with the natural world, but it's by way of this poetic imagination or an empathic imagination. Um, it's not going to be in our literal human language. So it turns out the world is just not a static backdrop for human activity. We exist in a responsive world of change and flux, flux, which seems to me to speak to the actuality of Neptunian dimensions and its abundant wellspring of imagery. And so here we stand in the realm of archetype. And Neptune, let's recall, contains all the archetypes. And we find that to engage the world through the lens of archetype is to journey, to journey far beyond the confines of prescriptive schemata for analyzing and organizing our experiences of life and to tumble, tumble into a world which is forever becoming, <coughs> unfolding, mysteriously revealing different, even contradictory <coughs> facets of itself to the beholder. So, the psychologist James Hillman, he produced a book entitled Healing Fiction. And I kind of like that phrase to describe the process of re-enchantment, of reconnecting with the cosmos and an earth which is sentient. In Healing Fiction, Hillman is asking us to not take our stories literally, to understand the mythic on its own terms, for this is how psyche operates, and he claims that's what it wants. Psyche wants symbol and metaphor and that kind of fluidity and flexibility rather than the dead letter, the so-called factual account, the pat, the pat narrative with a set cast of characters. Hellman claims a fluidity of identity, a multiplicity of perspectives. In short, the presence of uncertainty which brings the possibility for a creative response is what will foster psychological wholeness and good health. And we can see just how deeply psyche is embedded in cosmos, that the cosmos is most deeply understood by analogy, by a poetic regard for its stunning maj majesty. So I invite you to expand the notion of psyche beyond the individual human, and imagine psyche extends into the earth. You could even say it's coextensive with the earth, that the planets are also psyche. They respond really well to symbol, to metaphor, to a fluidity of identity. For example, the multiple identities of a single river. Depending on who in the web of life you ask, the answers are going to differ. Frogs, beavers, blue-green algae, and bats, they're all going to tell you a different story about that river, what it is. And the river has its own regard of itself, to be sure, its own perspective of its place in the earth community. I just wonder, is, is not this the embodiment of the archetypal perspective, the richness and multiplicity of expression, the seemingly infinite combination of relationships that produces a shimmering variety of qualities emanating from a single phenomenon that we, some people, call river? Moreover, it's, <laughs> since we sincerely do not know the whole story, and maybe, maybe that's a good thing, Perhaps this is what characterizes a successful reunion of human with cosmos, human with earth, that we engage the mythic dimension on its own terms to allow for its particular reality. So as this is a process of re-enchantment, not a proposal to simply be swallowed up and possessed by the mythic, we want to know that we're creating a kind of fiction, a healing fiction. We want to engage in what the philosopher Immanuel Kant called a highly played game as, of as if. But look out, this, this is, allows a critical perspective. It's an important awareness of story, but it's not the total negation of story. Don't take your as if literally. 
we got to look out for Saturn. Um, the embodiment of Saturn suffered a lot under disenchantment because the mythic mode, it is, it's real. It's real. It has a reality. Even scientific materialism, for example. Only what our senses in this, this world tell us is, is real is what's there. There's, you know, forget about metaphysics. That's, that's a mode of storytelling. It's a particular archetypal vision. And it's true. I think in some ways we're, we're always and already possessed by the mythic, by the archetypal, but it, I think it really is possible to not literalize it and to continually gain a different perspective the multiplicity of perspectives that are possible to see through our visions again and again to engage with the multiplicity of, of psyche. And so, what, let's see, what do I want to do? It's 8 o'clock. I would love for us to break into small groups of three. Hopefully we'll break out in three. And, um, you know, I've spoken of disenchanted, enchanted, um, and it would be great if we could break into small groups of three and take five minutes each to kind of share your reflections on the material so far, what it's brought up. These are just some of the key points that I, I made. Um, and if you feel comfortable, you could share your own experiences of enchantment or disenchantment, um, what that means for you, if anything, where you connected or didn't connect with these ideas. Um, and I think it's an opportunity to be open to and present to the incredibly diverse experiences of consciousness. That's one of the great gifts of the astrological perspective. Um, so the, that humans are creatures of belief. There's a contingent nature of knowledge. There's the primacy of mystery and the unknown within our conceptual reality. You can feel kind of woozy when you really realize that. Um, the perpetual character of the act of knowing and the universe as an analogous, a poetic phenomenon. So we would be cool with finding groups of three, if that's possible. Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to hear all the different conversations and have a conversation with a couple of you. Um, so would, would, some, would one person from one of the groups like to share anything that emerged from your discussion? No pressure. Okay. Um, or just one thing oh, thought, do we need the microphone? Yeah. So I don't have to repeat. We don't have to do people's mic. Um, I was just sort of as we were kind of processing together, and I was thinking about my own chart, and I have a Mars. Or we, well, first we sort of started thinking about how you know you tend to think of your illusions as maybe bad, you know, or your right. projections as somehow like psychologically inferior or immature and right. and yet maybe there's they should probably be looked at with a little bit more sort of respect or like you would say enchantment because there's a dialogue that's happening in any sort of mm -hmm. projection like that or any sort of illusion it's not just like if we're trying to get out of that disenchanted sort of world view then honoring the objectivity of the other or the world would sort of necessarily mean that it has its own play in that illusion. It's not just you making stuff up. It's a, it's a response. It's a dialogue. And I thought that was really hmm. a new perspective I hadn't really thought of before. So wow. it was worth sharing. Beautiful. Yeah. You just prefigured the, one of the last parts that I'll go over. It's <laughs> great. Prescient. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and we're, we, ran a, we went a little bit over. I'm, a, I'm having a heavy Neptune. I'm super, super duper Neptune for probably the next six years. So <laughs> we went a little bit over. <laughs> I'm in it for the long haul. Um, I don't have a choice. So now, thank you so much. That was a great segue, Laura. Um, I would like to, to discuss a few, of, a few principles which are useful for orienting in Neptunian uh, consciousness. And I first developed these um, in order to help people like me who have a lot of Neptune in their charts to creatively deal with the challenges and the opportunities of Neptune. And those can be really poignant due to the wider culture's lack of acceptance of our experiences of life, um, of the, the lack of separation between self and other, the ability to be deeply empathic and to, to be present to, to usually suffering we seem to, Neptunian types seem to really be sensitive to. And the wider culture is just like, that's not even possible for you to, to be that way. And 
there's also just a general mishandling of the human thirst for meaning and purpose. All the addictions going on in this society. It's unbelievable. So I've tried to adjust this to address the general audience more, but some of what I say may be a little mysterious. Unless you were born with Neptune in your chart, you had a heavy transit or a spiritual emergency experience and that kind of thing. So the first um, principle I've found very helpful with, with Neptune is community. And when I think of re-enchantment or the attempted rehabilitation of any planetary archetype, I think first of the lunar dimensions of life, which have been so backgrounded. Um, the, the moon that's within Neptune, it encompasses relationality, the body, the instinctual activity of our psyches that happens with, without our conscious orchestration, our emotionality, um, what nurtures us, and how we belong to a group. And so when it comes to the self-reflection that Neptune seems to really require of us, it's not an entirely solo enterprise. It doesn't seem to go so well if you're just talking to yourself in your head all the time. Um, and this is where Neptune can really just easily become a house of mirrors, confusing, misleading. And so it's so helpful to be in relation to others um, as you go along your spiritual path or really any sort of developmental path um, to, to find peers, to find good reflections. Because when self-reflection is performed in total isolation, it's easy to get caught up in a single story, like miss the bigger picture, um, and just to, to go off the deep end entirely, lose touch with consensus reality. Um, so being in community, which to me it implies a diversity of perspectives. Community is not a cult. Um, we're all think alike, none think at all, I think is how Walter Lippmann put it. And, but being in community, it seems to knit Neptune together. It makes it that much easier to render meaning from experience, images, and the messages of psyche and nature. And maybe community activates other parts of our being. It sort of draws on the variety of archetypal complexes within us, and it challenges the attempt to take ourselves and our stories too literally to get that other perspective, right? And it mitigates the tendency to an unhealthy narcissism, Neptune narcissism being too self-absorbed and unaware of the grand drama of life and the trials and hardships which can help put personal matters into a more powerful perspective. Not negate your personal problems, but to put them into a more powerful perspective and to spur one to compassionate action on behalf of others, on behalf of yourself. And, and the idea of community I would include not just the human, but the greater than human, the earth community. The natural world can act as a powerful mirror of our own psyche, as well as providing a super practical conduit for re-enchantment when we take the time to build a greater connection with the support and the vibrancy and the intelligence of the world around us. Um, and this can be in your backyard, in a park, in the city. It doesn't have to be out in this beautiful redwood forest where I live. It can be anywhere um, that you can connect with the natural world. And at its best, um, well, I do want to say, too, that the narcissism of the idea of community being more than just the human uh, when I think of the process of disenchantment, of dislocation from the cosmos, of dislocation from the earth, it, hasn't it been this process of slowly like coming completely into this internal narrative of the human, by the human, for the human, and not hearing the other voices of the planet, the other voices of the cosmos? And when I think of the brutality that happens because of institutionalized racism, it's not hearing the other voices, the others, the, those, the others, those that are different, from the institutions that have been set up through, through the centuries. So a community is diversity. And um, I think at its best, human community can provide a kind of mirroring for our psychic reality um, through mirroring, though mirroring that's developed as a particular skill can be really incredible for those that are offering and receiving. When, when you can develop the skill of listening deeply to someone's soulful stories, stories with charged with meaning and purpose, and pick up subtle cues and patterns, and hear even archetypes or myths being told, and offer that back in reflection to a person, it can be just breathtaking to be seen so deeply. That's so curious, like why? Why is that? And, and also for the person offering the reflection, um, a friend of mine, uh, Molly, told me about a spiritual teacher on Mount Madonna who said that once you understand how another person makes sense of his or her own life and experience, you will fall in love with them. So again, once you understand how another person makes sense of his or her own life and experience, you'll fall in love with them. And so this 
experience of, of mirroring and its power, which is something astrology naturally offers all of us, with this tremendous gift of being able to understand and even love someone or something radically different from you. It reminds me of something a mountain once told me, Mount Diablo, in fact, over in the East Bay, offered to me that to belong is to include. To belong is to include. And it's something of a riddle, just like mirroring. You know, why does this mirroring work when someone else sees me? I can't even see myself, and someone can see me. And is it maybe just a part of Neptune's delight? It's so hard to know what all is hidden by virtue of our being both the container and the contained. And so that's community. Um, curiosity is another principle. Super helpful. It's a fabulous ally in many situations. Um, as Caroline Casey puts it, irreverent curiosity. You want to have respect in your inquiry. But, you know, it's whether you're born with a strong Neptune or experiencing a heavy Neptune transit, the faculties of intuition, emp empathic knowing, as well as phenomena as dramatic to this culture as tele tele telepathy or clairaudience, hearing things you're not supposed to be able to hear, those require discipline cultivation to develop. And they do carry the great potential for self-deception. And unless you spend a lot of time developing, here's the Saturn part, developing, cultivating, um, working at it, to, to, to know how to interpret or classify incoming information. And even if you think you know, look out. Because it's, it's important to hold that kind of information um, really lightly, really lightly. And don't take it literally, right? Just be careful with literalization and really confirm it in the realm of ordinary com communication before you assume that you understand, that you, that you create knowledge with this information. So don't speculate on your intuition. Um, the hilarious thing is that the information you're receiving can be absolutely accurate and your interpre interpretation can be spectacularly wrong. Um, in short, you know, information is not knowledge. Knowledge is constructed. Um, you can detect the deep sadness of someone and create a whole, a whole story about that sadness. And it's, it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> and so all, you know, really awkward situations can occur. And also hurting people can occur when, in fact, a lot of Neptunians want to help. But allowing others their subjective experiences is so important so that the connection can happen. The true mirroring can happen instead of a projection, what you think is happening. So... This orientation of curiosity um, can make the difference between cultivating delusion and chaos in your life and creating an asset from Neptune's susceptibility to subtle psychic impressions. Um, and so, and this is so much to me about re-enchantment is the, that kind of curiosity, not taking things literally, not collapsing phenomena into a single explanation. Um, I, I do want to give this one concrete example, um, hearing messages in songs. So I know this to be really common in people, not just very, really Neptunian people, like to, to the song that comes in with the perfect lyrics or the mood to catalyze understanding of oneself or a particular situation. It's just hearing it at just the right time. It can feel like the universe is talking to you. Spooky, <laughs> right? <laughs> and in a way it's true, the cosmos is talking to you. But if you take that one step further and um, Let's say, just for example, think, believe, the songwriter was born solely for the purpose of delivering that message to you. Don't laugh, this happens. You might be heading down the path of delusion, you know, of literalism. And, and really, I think a key to this is, is what's happening there, is you're interpreting the world as being only centered on you. And this is very much the disenchanted worldview, is only centered on you rather than also centered on every other being. It's an omnicentric universe. And so literalism of that kind, it kills the community of life, both that outside of oneself and within. And so all manner of soul work, as Laura was, was gesturing to, is of coming to know the various characters of one's psyche really requires a lot of curiosity and reverence. Um, okay, the next principle, and I've got one more, and then we'll talk about working with personal archetypes. Is that too? Um, psychic hygiene, I like this term. So it's, it, it's about projections and narratives about events. And first, I want to caution everybody in this room about using people's natal charts to cast them in a particular light and interpret their actions through a rigid framework. 
the psychological understanding that um, astrology can offer comes through an exercise of the empathic imagination. Knowing and understanding there are so many different ways of experiencing, embodying, and participating in the cosmos and in divinity. Astrology can open a person up to the incredible psychological diversity of the human species, as well as opening up the, the, the individual up to the many persons, the many voices, the archetypes inside of oneself. And it's just too easy to demonize other people using their charts. I think it's, it's the beginner's mistake, and even the advanced person's mistake. Um, and close off real connections with real people. So rather than bringing us closer to others, this, this mirroring, this, this capacity to be present, it's, it, um, or even tolerance <laughs> you know, of others, it can be used as a weapon, as a defense, um, to, to ward off the transformational alchemy that relatedness promises us. So for example, oh, that Mars, Saturn, Pluto, all they want to do is control them, mow down whatever feels threatening to them. That may be true. You know, it, really, it may be true, but that is not all that's going on within that person um, that's animated by Mars, Saturn, Pluto, and there's so much more of that person to relate to. Um, more, and there's more about Mars, Saturn, Pluto to discover. My God, but you'll never discover it if you think that that's all that it is. Um, if we let our inner narrative about other people dominate our psyche, rather than reaching out to participate with the consciousness of the cosmos, to wit, living in an enchanted cosmos, allowing the other person to have their own feelings, experiences, their perspective, and so on, then we're missing out on a creative moment, even a magical moment in some cases, um, particularly when you reflect on uh, some of the really wounded, wounded karma each of us have you know, with certain people um, that could be healed by being present to this moment, to this person, to this planet, not to the old trauma, not to the bad dream, that the one or the other is locked in. So again, it's like, be curious. Um, and okay, and then for projections, it's, it's like trying to have others hold other parts of your personality for you. And sometimes it's, it's like the stuff that you, you reject, you don't identify with, and it it's, can be a very innocent act. You don't, you don't know about it. Um, and these could be good qualities. It's not all, you know, like, there's the sinister projection, there's the golden projection. Those are fun. Those are real fun to take back. Um, it's just, or even the bad stuff too, I would like to make the point that there's so much power and wisdom in what we or society has deemed bad if it's handled well. There's a lot to be turned into an ally there. And I think that one of the key insights of even admitting the existence of the unconscious, um, that there is an unknown dimension within all of us, is that human nature has some incredibly unsophisticated facets to it. Incredibly. Um, but denying that in oneself, denying that that's me, invariably leads to projecting it onto others. And whoo, hilarity ensues. I mean, we've got wars, we've got all kinds of stuff going on because of this. Um, so that's a little bit on um, psychic hygiene. And the last principle I'd like to offer is healthy boundaries. <laughs> and so <laughs> this is something that Neptunians really, wow, we, we get to learn about it or, whoo boy, or it's, or we get to learn about it again. I like that. <laughs> and it, it is a content, knowing is endless. There's a continual process, right? <laughs> but um, I would like to take a drink first. <laughs> I offer for your consideration though. Boundaries aren't what divide us. They are what connect us. Boundaries don't divide us, they connect us. So they need to be nurtured, tended to, loved, expressed, state your boundaries, find out your boundaries, nurture them. And sometimes distance is a, is, a, is a part of healthy boundaries. I've had, as a Neptunian, I want everything to be perfect and everything's, well, sometimes it's not. And sometimes taking some distance is the respectful, the right thing to do to let healing happen, of, what, of whatever sort. So, um, and I think too on this, not being narcissistic about our personal development, we're really, <laughs> We're related to others. This is the moon. There's so much about the moon that needs to be re revivified. Um, we're related, and 
we have to make that an effort to honor that lunar dimension of life. And so whenever I say self-reflection, you know, I'm, it's always for the purpose of greater connection, especially to others, other beings. So when we discover wrongs we've done, it's a great exercise to go out and try, try to make amends, to acknowledge to the other our impact. Once we're aware, I mean, be gentle, um, and to do so for the sake of the relationship, not for your ego's needs. Because somebody can throw an apology right back in your face, but that's not the purpose of giving it. And I think it's, it's a, a wonderful to, to do that, to reach out, to be that vulnerable. It exercises the part of wholeness in you that is going to take the place of the wound that you've been acting out of. And if we don't exercise those parts of wholeness, the, the parts that have the capacity for presence, for, for loving, for flexibility, they're not going to get airtime. They're not going to develop. We're not going to be able to integrate and be able to act out of those places. The wound is going to just continually be our go-to point of this is how I'm going to protect myself, whatever the situation. So I can't get into all the vagaries of truth and reconciliation here, but just to make a note of it. Um, okay, so the last section. Okay, we have time. We have time. Um, dee -dee -dee is... Um, our fragmentation and our wholeness, working with personal archetypes. And I feel like this is the biggest takeaway I'm offering with this talk, so I'm going to give it last. And so I've been meditating uh, into the now current transit of Saturn square Neptune. That's focused right diggity dog on my son Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> it's right on my solar mercury. And so I'm like, woo, boy, that could be a lot of things. But I'm trying to set intentions for how I'd like to focus that energy, right? How I'd like to cooperate with my own growth through those energies. And so Saturn, square Neptune, it could be the incarnation of the divine, oh, let it be. It could be um, a psychotic break. It could be terrible illness, sickness, mental illness. It could be... Um, a profound, seeing through, seeing through the shadow, a crystallization of understanding, um, the birth of the mystic. I mean, it could be so many things. Um, and I realize in a profound way, I have no control over how all that's going to play out. That's, for me, that's rule number one. Um, but setting an intention is, is not like setting a goal. It's more like a prayer or an invitation to the cosmos, like, hey, I'm ready to play. I'm going to try to play with this. And sometimes I find it can provide solace for when the difficult manifestations of a transit um, occur. My intentions that give me an, an orientation point for when I feel swamped or smacked upside the head by life, sometimes literally. Um, it's something to strive for. It even, even if it turns out I have to abandon that attention because something greater has emerged out of mystery. And um, so I've come to approach transits as an opportunity to become acquainted with at least two types of so-called personal archetypes. And so in order to explain this process clearly, I'm going to give a quick and dirty um, intro, yep. I'm going to give a quick and dirty breakdown of a systematization of the psyche that's emerged from the work of eco-psychologist Bill Plotkin and the guides of Animus Valley Institute. So Plotkin put together this nature-based map of the psyche um, based on observations that he and other guides um, made of people who were going out on wilderness vision quests. Um, some of you might have done this with Professor James Anabina at La Terra, Mississippi. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. You can do it for credit here at CIS. But these wilderness vision, vision quests, Animus Valley Institute hoped would facilitate encounters with soul, with the numinous core of the human being that can provide a mysterious guiding mythos and a sense of deep belonging to this world, to this cosmos. And there is a lot more to this and to their work, but this is quick and dirty. We're short on time. Um, so through guiding people through the mysteries of nature and psyche, Plotkin started to track common themes and patterns in people's experiences of their psyche and the fundamental organizing principles they encountered within them, the archetypes. And so rec he recognized the connections between nature and psyche. For example, at certain times of day, certain areas of the psyche seem to be more accessible to us, like more at the surface, whether our emotional wounds, like at midday going out looking for one's wounds, our fiercely protective parts um, that are going to keep us safe late at night. You know, staying up late at night, the inner critic is just chewing you a new one. Um, it just, they just seem to come up at certain times of day. Or, um, let's see, recognizing this, he started to place these archetypes on this, this wheel, directional wheel, and um, 
reflecting natural cycles and uh, processes. So dawn or spring, midday summer, this could also be east, south, west would be fall at sunset, one of my favorite times to do shadow work, soul work, and um, the north being winter or midnight. And each of these four directions, and don't take it literally, it has a flavor or a quality to it that adds to sort of understanding how to deeply work with those parts of the psyche. And so in this particular view, and it's just a map, it's not the territory, um, how we relate to ourselves, both through our facets of wholeness, so those are on the outer here, so our facets of wholeness, meaning those parts of us which are relatively stable, steady, responsive, able to respond to scenarios with reflection and poise, a capacity for presence, and this is you know, also the ways that we relate to ourselves through our fragments, or what Plotkin calls our subpersonalities. And these are parts on the inner wheel that tend to operate outside of our, our awareness. They're just autonomous, doing their thing, and we're like, what? But they tend to react, to lash out, to hide, so on, whatever their activity. The basic commonality, I think, in subpersonalities is that they're frozen in some place in the past. They're locked away from the present moment. And so I'm introducing the schematic to you because it's been incredibly helpful on my own personal spiritual path as well as for others I know, but it also helps me explain just really easily what I mean by using the energies of transiting planets to get acquainted with the subpersonalities and fragments with a view to cultivating wholeness, that is, cultivating a loving relationship um, with those parts, like taking care of their needs from the perspective of the self, that calm, available, and compassionate, capable part of us. Because it's crucial to understand these wounds are never going away. They're with us forever. They're part of, well, they're a part of who we are. Um, and it's entirely possible with a lot of love and a lot of attention to gain their trust, to meet their needs. To, with simulta that simultaneously meets your needs as a whole organism. And of course, this kind of self-healing and holding, it, it, it ripples out to touch everyone. And so just to use like a concrete example of this process of discernment, that I contend is available to all, to all of us, that barring organic defect. Um, reflecting on the upcoming Saturn, how else am I gonna say it? Reflecting on the upcoming um, like Saturn, or what's happening now, Saturn, Neptune on my sun, Mercury, I can ask myself, how can I allow this energy to support me? Which of these personal archetypes will be animated? On the wounded side, I've identified, I've got a great victim, and I've got some, someone I call the slave. So these can go crazy. Um, or on the generative and whole side, could it be the pioneer, the mystic? Of course, one will have to become familiar with one's you know, own court, inner court, with one's particular variety of subpersonalities, and also the feeling and the presence of the parts of oneself or wholeness. And it's so important to understand, it's like you, you don't have control over who shows up. You really don't. The, remember, you know, curiosity and engaging with the realm of Neptune. New parts of oneself can show up throughout a lifetime for whatever reason. The psychological shadow, that's what we are unconscious of, not what we know about and don't like, what we don't know about, is long, 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 perhaps longer than a lifetime. And what we are unconscious of is also not always a bad thing. There's some good stuff hiding out there that we don't know about. So, so just speaking from my own journey, I've, I've noticed how important it is to make contact with my wholeness, what is functional, whole, steady, and capable within my psyche, and to cultivate a relationship to that in order to even like see any kind of changes within my orientation to the world and its possibilities. Um, so Plotkin makes the point in Wild Mind, and I have his book here um, and, and elsewhere in his writings, that Western psychology is just obsessed with pathology, as if the point of spiritual development is like to wallow in your own problems and glories. Mm -hmm. And it really, it really wasn't until I connected with this incredibly loving parental figure um, inside of me, inside of me, that, that stuff started to come together, so to speak. And there, there were other parts of wholeness happening, the, you know, the, the sage, the wild indigenous one that can feel anything, everything, no feelings are bad or wrong. Um, the muse, the one in love with life. There were a big part of me beginning to, like, to start leaning towards wholeness. Um, but I found that the foundation of the process really is the loving, caring witness of me. It's an active love. You know, it reaches out to the hurting parts. It listens, it attends, it, lis it listens, it learns. It learns from all the like, hurting parts of me that have something to tell me. And so I'll note that eventually this process of being loving towards oneself will become 
leading to being loving towards others as well. But it's just, it's just, I think, really easy to get hung up in obsessing over woundedness. Oh, I'm so wounded. Whereas, no, really, there are some amazing, amazing elements of oneself to be developed and to be brought out and are probably expressing as well if, if we acknowledge them. Um, and it can take a long time. This is not taking a pill to make symptoms go away. It really, it's a different process for everyone. I don't think there is an end point to grasp for. It's not like, you know, woohoo, I'm there. Um, maybe the only thing to grasp for is love and compassion. There's just not a series of hurdles to leap over. I find that to be very unhelpful orientation to, to, to trying to cultivate knowledge of oneself, of one's psyche. And so, for example, I, I'll just make a few points ab about this process. So, yes, ma'am. Can you just read the, the four inside? I, I just oh. can't visually see them from this far. And sure. I want to know what they are. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, inside the circle, these are the, the subpersonalities, the fragmented or wounded parts. And at the top, we have our loyal <laughs> soldiers. These are the ones that will fight to the death. They're very tenacious, very Saturnian. They're, they're great to start with because they're so obvious. Uh, lion tamers, inner critics, also the inner flatterers, how great you are, right? And they're all about protecting the wounded children, including outcasts. And that's why you should be really like nice and grateful to them <laughs> because they've kept you alive, really. Um, they've, they've been so important to holding it together for so many of us. Um, to, to, to care and protect for these wounded children, orphans, like the orphans, the princess, the conformist, the rebel, um, there are a lot of different ways that these come out, but so the, that's the loyal soldier and the wounded child, and then our escapists and addicts, like how we try to get out of this in different ways. And on the inner side, on the west, is the shadow and shadow selves. Um, you bet. Thank you for asking. Um, and so the the what he calls the nurturing generative adult, the nurturing parent. Um, this is in the north, and you'll find that your loyal soldiers are taking the place of this nurturing generative adult a lot of times. Um, a great way to get in touch with that, that really loving part of oneself is one exercise um, that I did when I first was introduced to this work was <clears throat> late at night around 11 o'clock to sit down and write a love letter to myself. I've never cried so hard in my life to actually sit down and write a love letter to myself. And sometimes it's too hard for people. Writing a love, they got this idea from Drew Dellinger, actually, to write a love letter to the Milky Way. That's another way of, of getting in touch with that deeply accepting, caring, loving part of oneself. Um, so starting up here, I think that that is just like the critical ally for cultivating a relationship with the rest. It feels to me like a, a keystone, and I think he says the same uh, in Wild Mind, uh, Bill, Bill Plotkin does in his book. Um, and that book does offer a lot of practices that you yourself can use to like, become familiar with these parts of, of yourself. And, um, or if you have your own practices, to use this map, um, which he explains how to do it. I don't have the time to really go through a systematic, this is what you do with this. Um, but it's pretty functional to, to help integrate and orient your psyche. And it certainly is not the territory. It's not like, here's a rubric for becoming whole. It is, is definitely a tool. Um, but the fact that one's subpersonalities live in the same place as one's wholeness, um, just relying on those fragmented subpersonalities, strat strategies for success that have worked, got to acknowledge, you know, this work, this got me here this far. Thank you. Thank you for getting me this far. When it's true, and you can say at that point, thank you, my addict. My addict has taught me so much, so much. It has really, like, all about boundaries, all about my need for meaning, my need for belonging, my need for acceptance. It was living in the same place as the sage and the innocent, the one that can open out to life and it's brand new every single day you wake up and marvel, oh my God, I'm alive, wow. Um, so being really grateful, when, when one can get to that point, and it can take a process to get to the point of being grateful to, to the gifts that were also given by the subpersonalities. That's generally a clue when it's, you're ready to, it's integrated. You're ready to be like, okay, we have a better relationship now. Next time you come up, I'm gonna have a, another way of responding. So, um, yeah, mindfulness. <laughs>
It's the great ally. Noticing, being curious, paying attention, um, taking the feedback of others and wondering, even if it seems completely off the wall, is this true? Um, is this really going on or how is it true for me? Um, and let's see. That's what I want to say about you. I believe it just makes a big difference if I allow my own lack of mental discipline to kind of hijack potentially very maturing, very supportive energy that transits can provide, particularly Saturn transits, and to shunt it off into fragments and subpersonalities that just kind of take off. And even if they do kind of take off, if I don't have the discipline to, to track it, to notice it, oh, I'm doing this. It took me forever to, to come to know and love my addict. Forever. Years and years. I mean, it was the funniest thing. Like as soon as, and I'll say this on camera, as soon as I pick up the bowl and take the hit, I'd instantly go, I shouldn't be doing this. I sh like, I'm, this is not right, this is a wrong relationship. Not that it's wrong in general, but my relationship, this right now, this should not be happening. That happened for a couple of years until finally I could step back and say, oh, oh God, that deep longing I have inside for connection to the divine, I understand that now, I understand what I'm doing here. So it, it's just the, pro for me, for me, it's just the process of, of noticing, of noticing, loving witness to what's happening and apologizing to those who are impacted whenever I realize, oh, geez, what's happened? Because it's not just about me. There's other people involved. Um, so I can just use awareness to get more acquainted with those parts of me and become more whole, you know? And I can also use it to animate the archetypes of my wholeness, to, just to move into greater embodiment. And I think that's probably all I have to say right now about re-enchanting Neptune. Um, but I do want to mention a few other things, if I may. Um, I brought a couple of copies of the Queer Astrology Conference Journal, um, the first edition of that which uh, there's a talk I gave in there on ecosexuality, liberating the Venus within Pluto, and also some other great talks, a different perspective on astrology. Um, and there's also the next Queer Astrology Conference coming up March 20 to 22nd, manifesting now. It's called Reimagining Mars, Reimagining Mars, um, that I want everyone to know about. And I, I have some stickers and some business cards. And I also have a mailing list, which I don't know where it went. We're going to pass it around right now. Make sure you sign up on the boat, the Finuncio sort of sign-in sheet if you missed it. It just came late. We still want your name on it. Because I am um, really looking forward to developing and publishing some more information. I mean, these are just like tiny little headers to things I want to write about, what I've shared here. Um, so uh, realimaginal.com is my astrology website, and I am looking forward to building a community around the re-enchantment of the archetype of Neptune at that site um, as a sort of magazine format, but I'd like for it to be interactive. I'm trying to figure out how to do that so that it's high quality engagement. Um, and yeah, I, and this is, you know, this is kind of how I practice astrology. I've, if you want to do this, if not, I can, I can do all kinds of readings. But I, I love people who are into soul work or into self-healing and self-holding. I love going there. I love mirroring. Um, it's so magical and beautiful. And I love to watch people grow and explore whatever part of their psyche, whether it's the deepest, darkest, oh my god, I've never wanted to see that, or the most beautiful, beautiful thing about yourself that maybe you've denied or not been able to express. So um, I'm available for consultation as well. Thank you all so much for coming and revivifying Neptune together. And I wonder if there, we have a few more minutes, if there are any um, reflections or comments or questions or anything. Yeah, I got the mic. Thank you. It's like being on Donahue. <laughs> I hope I can frame this. I'm wanting more of a connection from you between Neptune mm -hmm. and the first part of your talk and this map. And okay. so I'm just wondering if maybe 
you might speak to Neptune in this map versus Pluto in this map, mm -hmm. just by way of contrast, what might come up differently so that we can understand Neptune a little bit more and the subpersonalities. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, I'm it, asking. It does, and I find my cognitive faculties compromised by lack of sleep last <laughs> night, so I will um, do my best. So this came up because of, I was really wanting to talk about how to work with personal archetypes. And the easiest thing for me to do was just, because this has all been put together in a systematic way, was to present this. Um, for me, the exploration of psyche is, is extremely Neptunian. It can be a house of mirrors. We deceive ourselves again and again because we want to be good. We want to be this that our mothers told us to be or our fathers told us to be or the culture expects. So it's, it's very difficult, I think, to even approach one's own psyche with enough reverence humility, love, curiosity, um, understanding the community inside of oneself, and being able to access community in the, in, the, in, the, in the greater than human world, the earth community, and also in the human world, to, to go through this, this process of becoming. Um, it just seemed like a number, well, and also I wanted to bring eco-psychology into this. Uh, that's one of, one of the things I, I want to do to, to pioneer with astrology is to bring the earth back into it. I remember David asking me, where's the glyph for earth? And I'm like, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's the embodiment piece, the, the being here in this body with all of its implications um, and connections. So definitely wanting the eco-psychology bringing the voice of the earth in. Um, all the exercises, for instance, in Wild Mind are about how you can co commun commune with the natural world to get to know yourself and to get to know the natural world. It's not all about just you know, me developing myself, but me having a relationship with, with the planet that's so supportive. It's there for us as much as we feel called to support and love it in this time of ecological crisis, I believe that the earth is there for us as well. There's this reciprocity that can be built. Um, and I think that this um, map also sort of re-embeds the, the human. And it's also is a, a, a very practical conduit for actual re-enchantment, for actually knowing how alive the planet is. I mean, when you go out to, to explore the innocent, the innocent wonder and child of you in the morning, and it's just so there so easy to walk out and be in praise of the earth and in praise of this little salamander and filled with wonder and, and awe. It's, it's so immediate. I feel this kind of re-embedment through the process of engaging this. So thank you for the question. I hope I answered it. I couldn't bring in Pluto. <laughs> Not too well. <laughs> so I guess I made the assumption that, so I assumed that the reason that this whole thing is Neptune is because there's four, the, the number of wholeness and completion according to Jung and Pythagoras, mm -hmm. um, and then Neptune being everything. And yeah. so, yeah, I guess I just made the assumption that the reason why Bill Clark even had this nature being Neptune as well, this is just all Neptune. Like it goes without yeah. saying that this whole thing is Neptune and everything else within it is. Mm -hmm. I love your answer. It is, oh, it, okay. well, I mean, it's not a univocal universe, right? It's analogous. Yeah. There are many ways of understanding and reflecting, and I think it's beautiful. Okay, and I also yeah. had a question. Yeah. You were talking about Earth. This isn't maybe related to Neptune, um, but I, I've also been under the impression that the sign Taurus is actually considered the Earth Aha. Um, and not Venus. Nice. That Some astrologers really believe that Libra has Venus and that Earth actually is owned by Taurus. So I just, as you were saying that, I was like, well, I wonder then if this is like Neptune and Earth and all that juiciness mm. together. So. Beautiful. Thank you. Random. That was all random. <laughs> Neptune. Perfect. <laughs> you're, you're fit in the gestalt. Um, maybe one more, or do we have time? Saturn says, <laughs> going once. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll bring up one more thing. Just because you're okay. operating, you don't have to go here. If you okay, don't have to. all right. Well, but, well we, we, wait, Donnie, wait here. Let, let me do it. I want to do it. I want to be the host. No. 
Um, I guess, you know, just because it came up, it, you know, if we think of this as a sort of personal archetypal way of sort of exploring in a map, and then, it, like she was saying, kind of connecting it to the very beginning of your talk, like, so then could we sort of look at this on a global sort of cosmic scale uh -huh. rather than a personal archetype? Like, uh -huh. how can something like this kind of help us to look at reenchantment in a really broad perspective, way beyond just an individual or my own mm -hmm. projections or illusions? I mean, do you want to, you don't have to take the bait. I'm putting it out there. Well, though. Wow, I would love to chomp that down, but I am, um, like I said, underslept. Yeah. There is also the interpersonal view of the self and self-personality, so how others see us. And um, so we've got, let's start with the top. Um, so the elder, the leader, the teacher, the manifester, activist, parent, mentor, healer, empath, king, queen. These are very generative, you know, like participatory out in the world. Um, Bill Plotkin's eco-psychology actually does focus a lot on our relationship and our responsibility to, to the sacred other in every form. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, then we've got, in, instead of all of these generative qualities, we can be rescuers, caretakers, codependents, enablers, the pseudo-warriors, robber barons, tyrants, critical parents, um, bliss heads, addicts, uh, addicts puers, uh, puellas, or you know, innocent sage, sacred fool, trickster. Um, and so I think that kind of gestures towards what you said, the, the relationship to, to the world and how others see us as well. Um, ways of accessing wholeness and recognizing activity that might not serve anyone in the situation, although it did serve for a period of time and should be honored as such. Yeah, for real. Um, and, and also, I will say too that over time, you will find your subpersonalities, and it's, it's a tricky business, particularly with, with loyal soldiers, um, will become fabulous allies. They can be great allies in how to, to take care of yourself. Like your victim always knows when you're about to step in it. Like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't do that. But it takes a lot, like cultivating a loving relationship, gaining trust from those parts, and um, so it is possible to do an interesting flip, and I think that that gives me hope, too, for social change as well, of being able to honor the, the woundedness in us and that it has, it has served so far here we are now. Now it's, you know, we can take responsibility and we can make a different choice. Um, so it was an attempt. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody, so much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.